I would like to um, acknowledge um, Margaret Hovenek and Peter Warrian, who so generously support and fund the integrated work of the Lupina Center. And a special welcome to you all, and particularly to those who haven't been to Regis before. I know that we um, advertised a little bit more broadly, realizing that this topic may be of great interest uh, beyond our walls, and so a very warm welcome to you, and I hope this will be the first of many visits to sessions at the Lupina Center and at Regis College more generally. Um, and of course, a very warm welcome to the usual suspects who are sitting in the audience as well. Um, it's my particular pleasure and privilege um, to welcome our speaker tonight, Dr. Beth Hale. Um, Dr. Hale is an assistant professor of moral theology at Carroll College in Helena, Montana. Um, at Carroll, uh, Beth teaches a range of courses from fundamental moral theology to healthcare ethics to marriage and family ethics. This fall, she will be team teaching a new interdisciplinary course on suffering, death, and afterlife. Um, Beth, or Dr. Hale, <laughs> received her doctorate from Boston College and in her dissertation, she brought a Thomistic approach to moral theology to bear on the very practical issues of eating disorders and body image disturbances, which she is currently in the process of preparing for publication. Beth is married to Scott Hale, who also teaches theology at Carroll, and they have a brand new daughter, Theresa Marie, who was born seven weeks ago and traveled to Toronto this weekend. And um, Beth, we're recruiting her for Regis College now. <laughs> um, Beth and Scott say they have very little free time, but they're enjoying the challenge of balancing their academic responsibilities with caring for their first and new daughter. And so a very warm welcome from the Lupina Center to you, Beth, and we look forward to your presentation very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mary, for that very generous introduction. I want to thank Peter and Margaret of the Lupina Center for um, bringing me out, for, out here and for the um, wonderful work that the Lupina Center is doing in integrating healthcare and spirituality and, and ethics. Um, I want to thank John Berkman for the invitation to come and speak here to you tonight. Um, I also want to thank um, Natalia Kononenko and Sanal Castellino, who have been um, so generous in helping with childcare for my um, very demanding seven week old. Thank you all for coming here tonight as well. I look forward to many comments from you after my, my talk. So, most people know about eating disorders. We're familiar with the terms anorexia and bulimia, we've seen TV shows and movies that depict women with eating disorders. We've heard about people like Princess Diana, a very high profile case, um, who admitted to struggling with bulimia. And people like Terry Schiavo, who tragically entered into a persistent vegetative state after going into cardiac arrest due to complications from bulimia, and ironically became the center of a debate about whether or not to remove her feeding tube. We also hear about celebrities like Mary-Kate Olsen who enter into eating disorder recovery centers after dropping to dangerously low weights. And all of us become voyeurs, at least in the United States we do, I don't know how it is in Canada. Um, we become voyeurs at the checkout line as we stare at these people's emaciated bodies on the cover of tabloid newspapers. We also know that eating disorders are a significant public health concern. Eating disorders have the highest mortality rate of any mental illness, about 10% of anorectics will die from their condition within 10 years. And eating disorders are often accompanied by other physical and psychological conditions which can be very dangerous for health, heart conditions, electrolyte imbalances, depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, tooth decay, osteoporosis, and the list could go on and on. These are no longer conditions that affect only adolescents and young adults as we might think. 
recovery centers are seeing middle-aged women in increasing numbers. What we may not know, despite everything that we do already know about eating disorders, is that eating disorders are also promoted as a lifestyle choice, uh, particularly by websites which label themselves as pro-ana, which is short for pro-anorexia, or somewhat less commonly pro-mia, which is short for pro-bulimia. These websites use what is called thin spiration, images of incredibly thin women, often celebrities or supermodels, to encourage girls and women to do whatever it takes to be thin. In addition to images, the websites feature information on how to purge or recipes for not eating. The goal for girls and women who visit these sites is frequently to actually develop an eating disorder. That's the explicit goal that many of them will identify. They want to develop an eating disorder. Online chat rooms and message boards provide tips and encouragement for want-to-be anorectics. One devotee, a 16-year-old, describes the impact of these sites. She says, I like the images of the skinny, happy girls. They look so confident, and I love how you can see their bones through their skin. It's the most beautiful thing ever. I also like the tips about food or how to ignore hunger. I really don't have anything against pro-ana sites. I mean, they help you a lot. Even though it's not good for society and other people, it can help you lose weight. And I'm not afraid. I'm ready to risk for perfection. Professionals are becoming more aware and more concerned about these sites. A recent report revealed that between 30 and 50 percent of teen patients in a Chicago area recovery center actively use social media to support their eating disorders. These the inspiration websites reveal a dimension of eating disorders that has not been explored, which I want to talk to you about tonight. This is the moral dimension. I am going to suggest that in part, Body image and eating disturbances, including eating disorders, are moral issues. This is a strong claim with potentially dangerous consequences. So let me begin by explaining to you what I'm not saying. I am not saying that people who have an eating disorder or related conditions are immoral or bad, and that those who don't have such a disorder are moral or good. The habits underlying eating disorders are, I will argue, widespread, and they touch us all. So my goal in saying that eating disorders are, in part, moral issues is not meant to indicate any moral judgment on the condition or the people who develop them. Secondly, I am not denying that eating disorders are multi-determined. Eating disorders are complex phenomena that are rooted in an only partially understood interplay between biomedical, psychological, and sociocultural factors. Bringing a moral perspective to bear on eating disorders is not intended to replace any other approach to talking about eating disorders, but to complement. In this way, I see my talk tonight as integrally related to the Lapina Center mission to explore the interrelationship between health and morality. You will also notice that I speak primarily about women. Eating disorders and body image disturbances are by no means conditions that affect only women. In the US, an estimated one million men are currently suffering from an eating disorder. However, what I want to talk about tonight namely the role of the thin ideal in eating disorder onset and maintenance is primarily a woman's issue. Men also experience body dissatisfaction and eating disturbances, but men seem to be driven by a desire for muscularity and a larger tone body, while women tend to be driven by the desire to be thin and waif-like. Because I want to look at the underlying habits or character traits that drive the quest for thinness in particular, I am going to limit my comments to women, though much of what I say can be applied to men as well. So let's return to my claim that eating disorders should be understood from a moral perspective. So why is this a controversial claim? First of all, because eating disorders are mental illnesses, characterized by a fear of gaining weight, false perception of the body, and what we might call the relentless pursuit of thinness. We are accustomed to thinking of mental illnesses as conditions that are beyond a person's control. People with mental illnesses, we tend to think, are sick. When a person who is sick does something that we would ordinarily disapprove of, we tend to excuse them. Their actions are not morally relevant. Such actions proceed from the illness and not from the autonomous will. However, this medical or disease model cannot fully account for the behavior of the person with an eating disorder. First of all, there's no clear biomedical cause underlying eating disorders. Genetics, physiology, and biochemistry may all play a role in determining whether a person develops an eating disorder, but are by no means, according to current research, the main reason. 
Moreover, pharmacological solutions have not proven enormously effective in treating eating disorders. The main reason why the medical model is inadequate for talking about eating disorders is that it fails to account for the ways in which conditions like anorexia and bulimia are pathological extremes of attitudes and behaviors that are much more widespread in the population. Eating disturbances, I will argue, I argue, exist on a continuum which make it incredibly difficult in many cases to determine who is actually sick. The fact is most women in this society are afraid of gaining weight. Many women, perhaps most, have a false perception of their body. They tend to think of their body as larger than it is um, or larger than would be ideal or healthy. Um, many women engage in compensatory behaviors in a relentless pursuit of thinness, even behaviors that we would consider inappropriate. Uh, behaviors like overexercise or purging. Purging is more common than you might think. Researchers claim that such a high percentage of women are dissatisfied with their bodies that some degree of bodily dissatisfaction and disordered eating ought to be considered normative for women. It's just the normal part of being a woman is to be dissatisfied with your body. In light of the difficulties in determining what constitutes disordered and normal, many scholars prefer to speak more broadly about eating disturbances rather than eating disorders. This view recognizes that psychopathologies like anorexia and bulimia are just simply extreme forms of attitudes and behaviors that exist more widely. What separates normal from disorder is accordingly a question of degree rather than kind. So let me give you the following cases. These cases are hypothetical, but they all come from real life um, or they're based in real life um, cases. First, we have Abby, who is a 19-year-old woman with a history of anorexia nervosa. She's currently 5'8 and 90 pounds. Uh, you do kil kilograms here. I didn't convert it at all for Canada. You'll have to excuse me. Um, her history of food restriction began when she was 11, and her ballet teacher told her that she had to lose 10 pounds if she wanted to continue in the program. Currently, she limits her food consumption to 800 calories a day and exercises for three hours every day. Still, she expresses strong dissatisfaction with her body, claiming that she feels fat most of the time. Bridget, our second case, is a 48-year-old woman who has struggled all her life with her weight. She is currently considered normal according to her body mass index, her BMI. Nevertheless, she claims that she is always on a diet in order to maintain this weight. She struggles with occasional overeating, which she follows either by long sessions in the gym for about three to five hours or several um, days long juice fasts. Even though she knows that she is of normal weight, she still feels extremely dissatisfied with her body, claiming that she sees a fat lady in the mirror. Catherine, our third case, is a 27-year-old woman. She is currently of normal weight. However, she is in a high-powered career, and during particularly stressful periods, about three or four times a year, she engages in binging and purging as a way of coping with stress. She claims that how she feels about her body determines her social life. I don't go out with friends when I feel fat, she says. And our final case, Dana, is a nine-year-old girl. She claims that she regularly counts calories to make sure that she does not eat too much. Although she is of normal weight, she is intensely afraid of becoming fat. She says that she would rather be hit by a bus than be fat. Of these four cases, only the first would likely have a diagnosable eating disorder, anorexia nervosa. But all of them have attitudes and behaviors characteristic of an eating disorder. Psychologist Kevin Thompson sees the range of eating disturbances from anorexia and bulimia on one end to obesity on the other end and everything in between as rooted in problems related to body image. He writes, appearance-related concerns occur in different types of eating, shape, and weight-related disorders. Even though the particular manifestation of the eating dysfunction may vary, for example, starvation, purging, overeating, the locus of body image disparagement is often theoretically and descriptively quite similar, end quote. What links the four individuals that I just gave you, in other words, is a desperate desire to be thin and a strong dissatisfaction with their body to the extent that it does not conform to the level of thinness they see as desirable. Characteristic of each of these cases also is how irrational they seem in respect to their quest for thinness. Anorexia and bulimia are characterized by irrational patterns of thinking and acting, but we can see in these examples that I just gave you how these irrational patterns are more widespread than just in those women with a diagnosable eating disorder. Surveys actually show that women and girls in increasing numbers would rather be dead than fat. Clearly, this is irrational. Sociocultural theories explain these irrational patterns of thoughts and behaviors as a consequence of the internalization 
of a thin ideal. An extremely thin ideal is widespread in the media, especially in advertising, where thinness is not only associated with what is desirable and beautiful, but also what is morally good. As one advertiser put it, you can never be too thin or too rich if you're a woman. According to the sociocultural perspective, women experience a significant social pressure to achieve a thin ideal and accordingly turn to dieting and exercise. For a notable minority of these women, these behaviors can contribute to the development of an eating disorder. Correlational and a limited number of experimental studies confirm that exposure to thin ideal images leads to an increase in body dissatisfaction in eating disorder symptomatology. The internalization of the thin ideal is considered one of the best predictors for the onset of an eating disorder. Thin ideal internalization measures the extent to which an individual cognitively buys into societal norms of size and appearance to the point of modifying her behavior in an attempt to approximate these standards. A person who has thoroughly internalized a very thin ideal of female beauty believes on some deep visceral level that beauty is equivalent with extreme thinness, even if she rationally knows otherwise. Individuals who show high levels of internalization overestimate their body size, thinking it larger than it actually is. They show increased levels of dissatisfaction and depression when their body is, is compared with extremely thin models. They desire to look like the ideal even if they know the ideal is unhealthy, even objectively not beautiful. And that's what's really key. Women want to conform to the thin ideal even if rationally they reject it. Uh, the effects of internalization can be summed up in the words of a young woman who says in regard to female models on TV and magazines, I hate them. I think they're too skinny and I would kill for one of their bodies. Thin ideal internalization is an exciting concept for researchers because it allows them to identify a critical risk factor for the development of body image and eating disturbances, including eating disorders like anorexia and bulimia. For our purpose for bringing a moral perspective to bear on eating disturbances, thin ideal internalization points us to the underlying cognitive and affective habits which drive disordered eating behaviors. It is the internalization of the thin ideal which makes pro Anna and other thinspiration websites so dangerous. When a woman looks at these images cognitively, she begins to see herself as too fat according to what she accepts as beautiful. Effectively, she begins to feel disgust when she looks at her body, anger at her inability to conform with the thin ideal and sadness at her perceived lack of self-worth compared with what the thin ideal seems to promise. This may drive her to act in ways we consider disordered, although as I have already mentioned, what separates disordered from healthy behaviors here is a difference in degree rather than in kind. She may stop eating or significantly restrict. She may purge. She may exercise for long periods or take laxatives and enemas. Time or circumstances may lead the behaviors or consequence, consequences of the behaviors to become extreme enough that she is diagnosed with an eating disorder. Most of the time, however, she will stay just below the surface of clinical concern. She will suffer, but not in the ways that we consider pathological. It may seem that we have made our task of bringing a moral perspective to bear on eating disorders more difficult. After all, internalization seems to show why people are not responsible for behaviors associated with eating disturbances, because the result of internalization is a set of cognitive and effective habits that lead one to act in ways that one would otherwise rationally choose. Typically, we think that the process of choosing is a rational, deliberative process of evaluating and weighing the advantages, advantages and disadvantages of a set course of action. To the extent that our choices are rational and voluntary, we call them moral, but to the extent that they are involuntary or irrational, we call them amoral. So this is the problem that we're faced with. We tend to think of morality in overly rational and overly voluntary terms. In order to make the case that we can, in fact, bring a moral analysis to bear on a broad range of eating disturbances, though these disorders consist of largely irrational behaviors, we need to turn now to Thomas Aquinas. This no doubt seems an odd move. What could a 13th century male Dominican priest possibly have to contribute to the discussion of a contemporary disorder that affects primarily women? And for those of you who have no exposure to Thomas Aquinas, that was your biography of him, 13th century male Dominican priest. Um, he's famous for writing the Summa Theologica. Um, I believe that Aquinas' ethical system provides us with the means of seeing ethics pertaining not only to conscious and willful actions, but also and primarily to character. Thin ideal internalization reveals the ways in which behaviors associated with eating disturbances 
proceed from set ways of perceiving, thinking, and feeling. This is what Aquinas calls character, and he held that we are responsible for the ways in which we develop our character within certain limits, as we will see later on. A person's character affects what she regards as good and desirable, indeed, what she regards as the good life. People with a good character, whom we call virtuous, are capable of living a truly good life. People with a bad character, whom we call vicious, are not. Moreover, a person's character is a product of time and training. People are not born either good or bad, though some may be predisposed in such ways that it is easier or more difficult to develop a good character. We come into this world needing to develop our characters in the ways necessary to live a good life. We need not only intellectual skills, that is knowledge about what the good life consists of, but we also need emotional strengths that allow us to pursue the good life. We need courage, for example, when the good life is very difficult to achieve. So ethics then, is primarily about the conditions necessary to live well, to flourish, which for Aquinas means both here on earth and eternally with God. The necessary conditions for the good life are good moral habits. Habits for Aquinas, contrary to what we may think and the way that we, we use the, the language of habits in contemporary parlance, are not mindless and insignificant routines, like biting one's nails. Habits are stable dispositions to act and feel in certain characteristic ways. The person with a habit of bravery or courage will feel strength and confidence in the face of danger and will respond accordingly. A person without such a habit may still will himself or herself to do the brave thing in, face, in the face of danger, but her action goes against what she feels like doing. For the brave person, her action proceeds from her firm and stable emotional dispositions. The key is that the virtuous person does what is good because they feel like doing that, not just because they know that's what is good. Here we see what is really key to this approach to ethics, the integral role of the emotions. The moral life is not about suppressing the unruly emotions uh, so that we can live intelligently, but about bringing the emotions in line with reason. It's about cultivating the emotions. The moral person not only does the right thing, she does it because that's what she feels like doing. In fact, habits make it possible to make moral judgments without conscious rational deliberation. Aquinas uses the example of chastity here, uh, the, the virtue that is involved with sexual matters. Um, a chaste person does not have to think critically in order to make moral judgments about matters related to sexuality. Such a person's moral judgments proceed from her character. Her judgments proceed from what we, call, what we might call an intuition, a feeling about chastity, which is rooted in the internal habits she has developed over time. So where do habits come from? They are in part natural. We are born with all sorts of dispositions that make us prone to certain emotional states. I think my, my daughter has a predisposition to certain emotional states, which uh, Sanal is dealing with right now. These tendencies can be fostered or thwarted by our environment. Uh, the main source of our habits, however, is a gradual acquisition over time. We develop the habit of kindness by acting kindly again and again and again for a long time. Over time, kind actions just come to seem appropriate or suitable or natural. Being kind makes us feel good. That is why, according to Aquinas, habit becomes something of a second nature. Our habits lead us to feel and act in certain ways because that's just the sort of person that we are. So how does this all pertain to eating disorders? I want to argue that the internalization of the thin ideal is the cause of a moral habit, a habit which does not yet have a name. By seeking out the thin ideal, say by looking at fashion magazines on a regular basis, one becomes habituated to see extreme thinness as a good. This habit may lead a person to judge that she is too fat, that she needs to lose a few pounds to be beautiful. The more she acts on her habitual judgment that thinness is good and desirable, say by dieting in order to conform to the thin ideal, the stronger her habit becomes. In a person with anorexia or bulimia, the habits underlying her judgments are so strong that she needs professional help to overcome them. This on top of the fact that the behaviors that proceed from these habits, like starvation, or purging significantly weaken the body, thus making her more vulnerable. A person with an eating disorder undoubtedly needs help. This does not mean, however, that she is sick. From this perspective, we can see how ethics pertains to eating disorders. 
The moral perspective we have presented here turns our attention to the underlying dispositions and habits which lead to a range of body image and eating disturbances. Eating disorders, I have argued, are in fact, uh, are in part acquired habits that lead to certain habitual ways of thinking and acting. This means that at least to some extent, one may be responsible for the development of an eating disorder. One may be responsible, that does not mean that one is therefore bad. Kristen Hagland, the Miss America winner in 2008, who used her title as an opportunity to speak about anorexia and other eating disorders, illustrates the importance of treating the moral dimension of eating disorders in her own story. As a preteen, she was sent to a ballet boarding school where most of her peers used restriction, extreme dieting is what restriction means, and purging to control their weight. And she reflects, and here's a direct quote, I looked at what they were doing, and so many of them were throwing away their lunches and not eating. I thought, if I can at least be thin, I know I can be successful at ballet. I remember the first day I decided to throw away my lunch and I drank a Coke instead. I felt really good. I remember that day and the choice I made. And it was a choice made out of fear, not logic. This choice led to more extreme choices. She writes, it was many days of small steps towards something extreme. It was a recipe for disaster in a really serious and painful situation. It's the language of habituation. She's making choices that are becoming ingrained habits. In order to support her developing eating disorder, she turned to the internet, particularly to the pro-Anna websites, where Thinspiration images motivated her to go to extreme lengths to be thin. Haglund's story, like so many other women's story, is not one of disease. It is the story of the development of a deadly habit. So does this mean the women who develop eating disorders are just simply responsible because they chose to pursue thinness? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. Um, the internalization of the thin ideal is in many ways beyond our control. Uh, the thin ideal is so ubiquitous that it is simply impossible to avoid. It's everywhere. Although it is hard to get a precise figure, women are bombarded by hundreds, perhaps thousands of ads every day, many of which use the thin ideal to sell products. The internet is particularly dangerous Due to keyword-driven contextual advertising, many websites are capable of generating weight, loss, generating weight loss ads, specifically for women based on keyword searches like BMI, diet, or even chocolate chip cookies. The vast majority of models used to sell women's clothing, lingerie, perfume, and makeup are extremely thin. Israel, in fact, just recently banned the use of underweight models last week. The vast majority of models used to sell women's clothing, or excuse me, um, to make matters worse, printed images of women are often airbrushed to make them appear even thinner, making the ideal even more unattainable for the vast majority of women. Everywhere, women are confronted with the ideal that tells them that thinness is beautiful and healthy and good. The thin ideal is firmly ingrained in our culture. How then can we say that women are morally responsible for internalizing it? Habits develop in part as a response to custom. In fact, the word that Augustine, uh, another great theologian um, from the fifth century, um, he uses a word for custom, consuetudo, to mean habit, and oftentimes with negative connotations. Habits or customs for both Augustine and Aquinas, if they are bad, diminish human freedom and distort one's knowledge of the truth. And this is exactly what happens with exposure to the thin ideal. The more women and more dangerously young girls are confronted with a thin ideal, the less able they are to come to see this ideal as unhealthy, undesirable, and bad. They become less free because of their habits to resist it. It is simply customary to try and be extremely thin. Custom for Augustine is a habitual turning towards the world, which can become an obstacle in the pursuit of the true good, God. The following quote from scholar Michelle Mary Lee Leliqua, who wrote a book on eating disorders, um, Starving for Salvation, uh, analyzing the spiritual dimension of eating disorders, helps us to see how the custom of regarding thin as beautiful becomes such a distraction for women today in their pursuit of integral flourishing. She writes, the pictures in women's magazines are not simply images of women. They are also bodily symbols. More specifically, they are icons of womanhood pointing to a seemingly transcendent truth, a feminine ideal that many girls and women recognize as ultimate. This recognition is neither fully conscious or unconscious. It is habitual. In a culture where few other models of womanhood enjoy such public visibility and influence, these icons are the visions and reference to which many girls and women learn to relate to their bodies, to others, and to their deepest anxieties and dreams. 
For many of their viewers, these images serve what has historically been a religious function, that of mediating the search for meaning in a world of uncertainty, injustice, longing, and pain. Augustine would say that these images move us to worship, worship the creature rather than the creator. Recall the young girl mentioned at the beginning of this talk who used the inspiration websites in her pursuit of perfection. She said, I'm willing to risk for perfection. Perfection for her is what? It's thinness. This thin ideal has become her god. It is in thinness that her true happiness lies. Extreme, or at least she thinks it does. Extremely thin icons of womanhood have become in this society representative of success, flourishing, happiness, and satisfaction. Ends which the Christian believes, at least in theory, can be found in God alone. In terms of their use and effect, we might say that these images serve the same purpose as medieval religious icons. If you have ever been into a medieval church or a church that is modeled off of one, like my cathedral church in Helena, you will likely be bombarded by a plethora of images. Stained glass representations of biblical scenes, paintings of Christ and Mary, um, statues of the saints. Margaret Miles, in her book, Image as Insight, points out that historical Christians were aware of the formative power of images. They expected to be shaped by them and to participate in the reality to which they pointed. Miles writes, despite the constant bombardment of images for commercial and entertainment purposes, images that compete to catch the eye and thus are highly effective in catching the wallet, modern people prefer to think of themselves as disengaged voyeurs. This is a form of self-deception that makes it difficult for us to sympathize with what we think of as the superstition of medieval people who are very conscious of themselves as powerfully and intimately affected by visual images. The quasi-religious nature of Thinspiration sites also has not gone unnoticed. Some of these sites, these websites, post what are called Thin Commandments. Uh, I'll read these just to see how many of them um, you might follow. One, you aren't thin. If you aren't thin, you aren't attractive. Two, being thin is more important than being healthy. Three, you must buy clothes, cut your hair, take laxatives, starve yourself, do anything to make yourself look thinner. Four, thou shalt not eat food without feeling guilty. Five, thou shalt not eat fattening food without punishing oneself afterwards. Notice how often times that commandment is actually um, embodied in the advertising that you see, the guilty indulgence in chocolate, and you need to punish yourself afterwards with a nice three mile run. Um, six, thou shalt count calories and restrict intake accordingly. Seven, what the scale says is the most important thing. Eight, losing weight is good, gaining weight is bad. Nine, you can never be too thin. And 10, being thin and not eating are signs of true willpower and signs of true success. The good news is that there is a growing recognition of the danger of thin ideal images. A few weeks ago, the social media site Tumblr banned Thinspiration websites as part of a larger campaign against promoting self-harm. When people search on the site for words like anorexia or thinspiration, they will be directed to a public service announcement with information on where they can go to get help. In shutting down the sites, Tumblr was taking seriously the literature on thin ideal internalization and its link to eating disorders. Looking at the thin ideal puts women at risk and makes it harder for those who have a disorder to recover. Unfortunately, other forms of thinspiration go unchecked in the magazines, television shows, and advertising. Um, industries. Science confirms what religion has known. Images have power. They have power to shape us emotionally, to make us feel certain ways. They have power to shape us intellectually, to shape our perceptions and values and ways of seeing and making sense of the world. And they have power to shape us spiritually, pointing us to the supernatural realities, the ultimate values which determine our existence. Looking at such images is not a morally neutral act. Reading a Vogue magazine is not morally neutral. It is shaping you morally. It is shaping your character. Watching the television shows that you watch shapes your moral character. Subscribing to magazines which promote the thin ideal, both in their images and advertising, or frequenting stores which use the thin ideal to market clothing and other products, all of these are morally relevant acts. All of these are how we become moral agents. 
Choosing to diet is a moral act. Making an offhanded comment about how fat we are or how we need to lose a few pounds are moral acts. These acts shape our character. They shape our perceptions, our affections, and our ultimate values. Ultimately, these acts determine in part whether our lives are oriented towards God, our ultimate fulfillment, or not. As such, we need to be aware of the moral significance of these acts. Not so that we can say that reading a fashion magazine is immoral or that it's wrong, but rather, rather so that we can say that it is at least a morally significant choice. Becoming conscious of the way little seemingly insignificant acts, like the magazines we read or the television shows we watch, how they shape us, that's a large part of what Christian morality is, is about. Our habits, the way we develop our character, is also a big part of what health is about, too. We see this so clearly in the case of eating disorders. Character, in part, determines health. Health cannot be separated from character. It's both and. We cannot adequately address the health of women suffering from eating disorders unless we address the moral dimension of these conditions. But more importantly, the habits underlying eating disorders are widespread. They are habits that affect most, perhaps all women, in this society. And these habits keep most, perhaps all women, in this society from fully flourishing. Attending to the moral dimension of eating disorders is not just about attending to the health and flourishing of the millions of women suffering from anorexia and or bulimia. It is also about attending to the ways in which our society keeps women from true health, true flourishing, and true happiness by promoting thinness as what Aquinas would call the summum, the, the summum bonum, the greatest good. So I want to conclude by thanking once again the Lopina Center who has made its mission to attend to the ways in which health encompasses the integral flourishing of individuals in society, not only on the mental and physical level, but also on the moral and spiritual level. And I hope that we can begin to pay attention to the ways in which our society is keeping women from that full and integral flourishing. Thank you very much.